Welcome to the first presentation of the Earthquake Country Alliance Safer at Home webinar series. My name is Ines Pierce. I'm Chief Executive of Pierce Global Partners and Chair of the Earthquake Country Alliance Business Committee. I'm hosting today's webinar. We know many of you may still be working at home or perhaps you've remained in the workplace as an essential organization. Either way, we want you and your family to be safer at home and for you to be a resource in your community following a major earthquake. These presentations will cover each of the seven steps to earthquake safety with one webinar a month. Our webinar today will begin with a quick overview of the Earthquake Country Alliance and the plan for our Safer at Home webinar series. Then we will follow a scenario of what might happen in your home if nothing is secured. Next, we'll repeat the scenario, but this time you have secured the space. Then we'll conclude with discussion. Our primary presenters today are Mark Benthian, ECA's, Earthqu er, sorry, ECA's Executive Director, also Director for Education and Outreach at the Southern California Earthquake Center at USC. Glenn Grantholm, Vice President for Business Development with Safety Proof, and Trevin Reese, Account Manager for Ready America, which sells the Quake Cold brand of fastening products. Both Safety Proof and Ready America have been key partners with ECA for many years and are the primary suppliers of the materials that will be shown today's webinar for securing your space. Both organizations are committed to helping Californians be safe at home, school, and in the workplace. Glenn and Trevin are experts in our topic today and both have secured thousands of objects. Also with us today are Sharon Sandow and Jason Ballman of the Southern California Earthquake Center. Sharon and Mark will be moderating the Q&A and use that again for submitting questions to be asked of the presenters. And Jason and I will be moderating the chat. Use the chat to share comments or to report any technical issues. First, let's hear from Mark Benthian about the Earthquake Country Alliance and the Safer at Home Earthquake Series. Mark? Thanks, Inez. So today's webinar is hosted by the Earthquake Country Alliance, which is a partnership of many public, private, and grassroots leaders across California. We have three re active regional alliances that coordinate activities in Southern California, the Bay Area, and the North Coast. And if you're along the Central Coast of California, we're looking for leaders. Everyone can join our mailing list to get updates and fu about future webinars and other activities by going to earthquakecountry.org slash alliance. We also have statewide sector-based committees that you can be a part of, including the business committee, which is the organizer of today's webinar with Inez as chair and our other presenters as members of that committee. And you can learn more about the different committees and how you can participate at earthquakecountry.org slash committees. Earlier, Inez mentioned that our Safer at Home webinar series will follow the seven steps to earthquake safety. These are a set of simple actions that to improve safety before, during, and after earthquakes. You can learn about the steps at earthquakecountry.org slash seven steps. This shows the planned schedule for the other webinars in our series. We will be finalizing the actual dates soon, so check out the website at earthquakecountry.org slash safer at home, or join the mailing list so you'll get updated when the registration is open. One thing I wanna point out is that step one is all about securing content. Step four is where we'll be talking about the actual building, like what you can do to strengthen your property. Also talking about insurance and other aspects. So uh, today is just about the contents inside your building. So Inez, why do we start though with secure your space? Great question, Mark. Secure your space means preventing things from falling or flying across the room, causing injury or damage, or possibly blocking your path or exit. Doing this secure your space also means that you won't have to spend a lot of time cleaning up after an earthquake, allowing you to help others return to work, et cetera. And you won't lose your electronics, collectibles, heirlooms, or other valuable possessions. So this is important for everyone, as things can fall or fly across the room, even in the newest homes built to the latest codes. 
renters should also do everything possible to secure their space. That is why we put this step first. So pay close attention as we show you simple actions you can take today, this weekend, or perhaps in the next few weeks. If you're just joining, this webinar is being recorded. And I'll show you the link at the end where you can find it, this presentation and related information. We've just completed an initial overview and next we'll walk through a scenario of what might happen in your home if nothing is secured. Then we'll go back through more slowly and show live demonstrations of how to secure your space. So to start, let's see a short video of what happened more than 25 years ago to remind us all, to remind us all that earthquakes can shake things up at any moment. One of the things that I always think was particularly funny was that the night before I had gone to uh, a swap meet and I'd found this really cool printer drawer. It's like a big wooden drawer with all these little crevices and I sat it on top of the nails and I knew I'd have to shore it up a little better later. And I literally said to myself, this is the night before the earthquake. Oh, it's not like there's gonna be an earthquake or anything. Literally said that out loud. Okay, and of course, this was the 1994 earthquake that happened just a few hours later. When the quake hit, I was living in South Pasadena and I was married, had three little kids. It was a great world and there wasn't a lot of tumult going on. And on the morning of the earthquake, I happened to be in the newsroom recording a narration in a soundproof booth because I was covering a story from the night before. I was doing an all-nighter and as scientists do, I was working on a paper. And I'm reading my script and I'm doing a countdown and, he, and, I, and I, I turn to the editor and I said, are you rolling? He goes, yeah, I said, okay, we go. Narration, take one and five. I'm a very light sleeper. Four. Well, I was sound asleep, sleeping real good. Three. I heard something. It started out as a slow rumble. Two. And I jump onto my daughter. And it's like, next thing you know, the whole room is just shaking. <laughs> Look around where you are. What are the things that you haven't secured? Because you don't think the earthquake will happen tomorrow. Now I'm going to turn things over to Glenn Grantholm, Vice President of Safety Proof and member of our business committee. Take it away, Glenn. Thank you, Inez. Hello, everyone. Let's start with an imaginary scenario of what might happen tonight. For this scenario, imagine you and your 10-year-old daughter are home alone. I realize that for some of you, this is a bit of a stretch, but please bear with me. It's 9 p.m. and you're, you are in your bedroom watching television. Your daughter is down the hall in a room and all is well. And then the ground starts shaking you know right away this is the big earthquake they've been talking about. You hang on for dear life, thinking one thing only, I have to get to my daughter. But you can't move because the shaking's so strong. You hear things falling and crashing inside your home, breaking glass, loud and horrible banging. Eventually the shaking stops and your only thought is to get to your kid. Though the power is out, there's light coming in from outside. From the moon, you guess, it really doesn't matter. The television has fallen off the dresser it was on and both the dresser and the shattered television are now on the floor at the front of the bed. You climb over them and you make your way towards the door. In the hallway, Many of the pictures that used to line the walls have fallen to the floor and there's glass everywhere. You didn't put shoes on and you cut your feet as you head to your daughter's room. Cut feet and hands are a major reason why people head to emergency rooms following earthquakes. You reach the door to your daughter's room and try to push it open, but it won't move. I'm here, you yell through the door. 
From beyond the door, you hear your daughter say, I'm okay, but my bookshelf fell over in front of the door and I can't move it. You know, in the Napa earthquake of a few years ago, the 911 call center was flooded with calls with people trapped in rooms. To let you go, we have many 911 calls. Are there any injuries? Uh, I believe she's trapped in the house. The caller's on the line, though. I'm I do have, I do have, in my bedroom. I can't get out of my bedroom. Caller, caller, wait one moment. I do have the call. <laughs> dispatch, I do have the caller's call back number. For your no, I'm not, but I can't get out of my room. I'm, I'm trapped in here. That is, uh, that is horrific to even think about. You tell your daughter to stay stay on her bed and that you, you'll be back soon. You've got to figure out a way. To... When you get to the living room, all the figurines and collectibles that you had in a cabinet, they're everywhere, shattered and thrown all around the floor. The room kind of like looks like what happens in this earthquake simulation. Yikes. Now, I realize we don't, this is for demonstration purposes only, we don't have a, a water heater or probably a file cabinet in our kitchen, but I want you to watch this again. We're going to play it one more time. Pay attention to the vase of water that is on the table. The little hand is rolling around. Watch, just watch that vase of water. Well, you may have a lot of cleaning up to do after this earthquake, but you've got water that you can use. You know, earthquakes just act crazy sometimes. You can't tell, even in simulations, you cannot predict exactly everything that's gonna happen in an earthquake. That's why it's important to secure everything you can. But you look about your kitchen. This is a computer uh, animation. Uh, your kitchen even looks worse than, than what we're gonna show here. That's actually a, a pretty uh, wide open kitchen floor plan, but you do notice how all the cabinets hopped open and everything that was in them has, uh, has fallen out. Uh, we didn't see the refrigerator. There is, there is a great um, shake table video from Japan uh, about a refrigerator. So in this scenario, you see the refrigerators on the floor surrounded by what's inside of it. Let's check out the video. Uh, and this in a large building was built on a shake table in Japan and, and let's see what happens to the refrigerator. Did that fridge just do a pirouette? And the worst part for me is, is, you know, all the wine bottles fell out of it. At any rate, you can see your kitchen cabinets have flown open. There's stuff all over the floor. And as you're there, you wonder, I wonder if the food and water in my emergency kit has expired. What am I supposed to do now? The earthquake shaking ended two or three minutes ago and the first aftershock is on the way. And you are now one of thousands of people, including many of your neighbors who need help and need help now. So let's see, is there a way to change this script? We're going to rewind the tape and show you how to take simple steps to avoid the outcome that we just described. So how do we start? We're gonna begin with a, what we call a hazard hunt we'll be looking at do-it-yourself fixes for things that you don't wanna be a problem for you after an earthquake. Spe pay special attention to large and tall furniture or appliance that are top heavy. They may have a high center of gravity and they can fall over more easily when the ground shakes. But the point here is ha hazard hunts are simple and you can do one with your whole family. There's some simple questions you can ask when you're doing a hazard hunt. Ask yourself, can it hit me? Well, 
If it were to fall, could it hit or injure me or a loved one? Can it block me? If this item fell, would it block either me or my family from getting out of a room or a first responder from getting in? Can it burn me? If this item moves in an earthquake, could it potentially cause a gas leak, start a fire or worse? Think about your water heater, perhaps a gas dryer. Can it bankrupt me? Maybe you have something in your home that doesn't fit into one of these categories, but it costs you a lot of money and is priceless to you. You don't want it damaged in an earthquake. Perhaps it's a valuable statue or maybe even that expensive car in the garage that's surrounded by metal racks. You may wanna add a couple more categories to your list based on your situation. For example, you may wanna add, what do I not want to have to deal with after an earthquake? Maybe the idea of shoveling out your kitchen is not appealing to you, so you decide to get latches to keep your cabinet doors closed. Let's talk for just a second about insurance. Some policies allow you to have a separate lower deductible policy for collectibles or breakables, other contents of your home to provide coverage, even if you don't have enough damage to your building to exceed its overall deductible. We're gonna cover that in debt depth in our webinar on step four. We'll also dive then into the structural vulnerabilities that Mark mentioned previously. You see the hazards? Well, actually this is a video of another earthquake simulation. Let's watch and see what happens. That is stunning. Why did they put the speakers right, up, right above the bed? Move the speakers, secure everything else. Inez? Wow, thanks, Glenn. And also, thank you to all of you that are asking questions. Please make sure you put some questions in the Q&A, and we will get to as many of them live as we can, and we will answer the others, um, as you will hear about later. If you joined while Glenn was speaking, we've gone through an imaginary scenario of what might happen if nothing in your home was secured. Now we're going to rewind and go through everything again, but this time show you how to secure your space. Again, if you have any questions about each demonstration we're about to show you, please post in the Q&A. Ready, Glenn? Okay, let's run through this scenario one more time. Thank you, Inez. Let's start over and imagine again you're in you and your daughter are home alone. You're in your bedroom watching television. And your daughter's down the hall in her room. And then the ground starts shaking. This is that big one that they've been talking about. But fortunately for you, your TV and dresser did not fall over. That's because you took the step to secure them both. Let's learn how. Trevin? Hi, guys. My name is Trevin Reese with Ready America. Today, we're going to be showing you guys our line of quake hold fasteners. So today, we're going to start by showing you guys how to secure TV with our universal flat screen strap. So TVs can turn to dangerous projectiles during an earthquake if they're not secured. Now remember, a lot of kids like to sit in front of TVs during an earthquake. So it's very important to make sure those are secured, seeing as those TVs can turn into projectiles. Now, it's really important too, if you can mount your TV to the wall to do so but that's not always possible. So today we're gonna to show you guys our universal flat screen strap and how to secure that to your TV. So as you can see you guys, right now we have our universal flat screen strap. This is a flexible nylon strap that is used to secure the back of the TV and to your TV stand. So I've already installed one of these straps right here so you guys can see. But it's really important too, if you're first gonna to wanna to install these, you're gonna to wanna to prep the surface with an alcohol pad. So that's what we're gonna do here first. Simply take this out. And these are all included in the universal flat screen strap that you can find at Home Depot, Lowe's, all the major retailers. So let's first prep the surface here. And you wanna make sure that it's about equal distance apart on the TV to form that secure bond. So once we've prepped the surface, you're gonna to wanna to let it dry for a couple minutes. And then you're gonna to wanna to take this strap. So you can see the flexible nylon strap right here. You have the adhesive that molds to the back of the TV, your quick disconnect, and then your 3M adhesive that's gonna to secure to the TV stand. 
So first we want to do is we're going to want to attach that as evenly as possible to the back of the TV. There we go. And then you're going to want to push down to form that secure bond on the back of the TV. Next, we're going to want to take the 3M adhesive and we're going to want to put that as evenly as possible down onto the TV stand and then push down to form that solid bond. Now let it sit there for about 24 hours to form that secure bond. And then if you do need to tighten it up, you can use this strap as well. Uh, these can also be attached to the wall studs. Uh, as you can see, there is a screw at the bottom of these as well that you can secure to the wall studs. Now what's really important for you guys for added safety measures is what's also included in the flat screen strap. It's the quake hold putty. You guys may have heard of this and seen it around. This is just a simple little putty material that is used for securing uh, all your breakables. So what we're gonna wanna do is for added protection, we're gonna want to take a little piece of this right here, roll it up into a ball, and then place it on all four corners of the TV stand. Now this will prevent the TV from falling over or falling backwards as well as additional support. Now you're gonna to wanna to give this about 24 to 48 hours to form a secure bond. And once you have done that, you have secured your TV. But what about the TV stand that it's sitting on? We're gonna to wanna to make sure that you guys secure that. So next we're gonna show you guys our line of furniture safety straps. Hey Trevin, can I jump in with a quick question? Should you Absolutely. use the straps for, commu for computer monitors? Yes, these can be used for commu computer monitors as well. That is correct. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's show you guys the fastener straps that we have. Take you guys back over to here. All right, so as you guys can see, we have our furniture safety straps. Um, we're gonna wanna make sure that you guys get those secured as well. So if you guys can see on the screen, we have different styles that you guys can use. Uh, these are flexible nylon straps used for securing TV stands, bookshelves, anything that can block an exit pathway or doorway. So let's make sure that we secure those because it's really important that after the shaking stops, you're gonna need to possibly evacuate your home. Uh, so you wanna make sure that there is a clear pathway out. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna show you guys how to install these straps. So what we've done to make it easy for you guys is we've actually cut giant holes uh, and this board to show you guys where the studs will actually be. So if you guys come a little closer here, we'll be able to see the straps. So these are also, these also come in different colors to match your guys' furniture. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is after you remove these straps from the packaging, is you're gonna wanna take the screw and the bolt and then find your stud and then drill the strap into the stud in the wall. Now, once you have done that, you can see it on here on the bottom is this little film. You just wanna remove that, but first you wanna also prep the surface with the alcohol wipes that are included. Remove that, place firmly on to the top of the cabinets or to the side, depending on the height of the uh, bookshelf or TV stand, and then put firmly down to form that bond. See, this is industrial strength Velcro. So this has, this one strap has a holding power of about 250 pounds. So this is not easy to remove but if you do need to move your furniture around the home, it does allow you to remove these and reuse these straps anytime. So now I want to help. I want to, we're going to show you guys how to secure or how to find a stud in the wall without having to drill a giant hole in the wall. Glenn, you guys take it away. So you don't want to do what one person did in the picture here. They almost found the stud then drilled hole after hole going left, and then put in a metal bracket where there was no wall stud. Yikes. By the way, we no longer recommend using those metal brackets. They get mangled in shake table testing. Plus, in order to get that metal bracket to hold onto the top of this entertainment center, they needed to drill into it. So the idea with flexible fastening is that a screw goes through a strap and into the wall stud. Because the strap is flexible, the wall and the floor can move independently of one another during shaking. The strap shown here is the safety proof version, which has a super strong adhesive and an easy to use fastener. The picture also shows a stud finder 
that is stuck to the wall. How did they do that? Let's show you how easy it is to find a wall stud. We now go to Trish Granholm and Carlos Herrera at the Safety Proof offices in Burbank. Thank you, Glenn. As Glenn said, I'm here with Carlos Huerta, a seismic specialist at Safety Proof. Carlos, what can you tell me about the stud finder you're currently using? Uh, well, Trish, this is a very simple stud finder. It is a rare earth magnet that sticks to metal. It will hold to metal stud or stick to the nail in a wood stud. This wall has wood studs behind it. Let's see if I can find the nail. Okay. Oh my goodness, look at that. Fantastic, thank you, Carlos. Now later on, we're gonna be showing how we actually physically attach uh, to the wall with the fastener. And this is a pretty good size refrigerator. We're gonna to try to see if I can give you a representation of how big this fridge really is, it's a good size fridge. Thank you, back to you, Glenn. So let's continue with our improved scenario. Because your TV and the dresser were secured and didn't fall over, you can go check on your daughter. You, ha you head into the hallway, which before was covered in broken glass, but now the pictures that line the walls are still in place. How did you do that? Well, it's important to use closed hooks that can hold the weight of the object. Most will list the weight, most of these hooks will list the weight that they can support right on the package. But let's go back to Trevin and learn about an amazing option. All right, hi you guys. So we're back again to discuss our uh, amazing picture hook. Now this is designed specifically to trap the wires on the wall uh, into the stud. So this prevents it from jumping off like a regular nail or stud would. So if we move on to the next one, we'll be able to see uh, if you get close up here onto the drywall that we have here, you can secure this with either using the nail that is included for lighter paintings, or you can use the screws that are included for heavier paintings. Now these hold up to about 100 pounds. So each one of these uh, can do at least 25 pounds. So if you have the smaller uh, painting, you're gonna wanna use to secure that for, um, for any smaller paintings that you guys are gonna have. So I'm gonna show you guys quickly how to do this. So if you guys do have larger paintings, it is helpful to have at least two people doing this because the weight of the painting will be a factor. So you will have to get in behind here and secure into the maze design if you guys See that you're going to want to put in both sides of the picture hook and then gently slide it in and finish through the maze design. Now that's going to prevent that from jumping off like a regular nail would, as you guys can see, just moving it around. It's not going anywhere. So once we've done that, it's really important, you guys, for larger paintings or if they have glass, you're going to want to make sure that you secure these as well. So what we can also do is I have our quake hold putty and you're gonna to wanna to take a little bit of this as well and then just roll it up into tiny baller strips like I have here. And then place on the bottom two corners right here, just a little bit on the bottom two corners and then push that against the drywall and that will prevent the painting from jumping back and forth during an earthquake. So it'll prevent it from swaying. Not only that, but it'll keep it even. Isn't that great? Well, now you've made it safely to your daughter's room. You can open the door because the bookshelf just inside was secured and it didn't fall and block the door. Your child has say, is safe and sound. You've practiced drop, cover and hold on earthquake drills at work, school and, and at home, but you've also taught your child a poem for what to do if she's in bed during an earthquake. It's easy to learn and simple to remember. Even an adult can do it. Repeat after me, stay in bed, put a pillow on your head. It's pretty easy, stay in bed, put a pillow on your head. Do that in your room as well. Now let's head to the living room and see what happened. Remember those collectibles, Trevin? 
All right, guys. So here I'm going to show you guys three of our very popular products for securing your glass or breakable items inside the home. So we have here is our Quake Hold Putty, our Museum Wax, which secures extremely heavy items, and then our Clear Museum Gel, which will secure the lighter items, glass, crystal, or china. So the most popular one is the Quake Hold Putty. So I'm going to show you guys how to install this one on just your household items around the home or items that aren't, very, aren't moving very often. So what I'm going to do here is you guys, I'm going to remove, remove the putty from the packaging and see here, I'm going to take a little bit out and all I'm going to do is I'm going to roll these into balls or strips. So that way we can secure the glass items or our breakables, vases, anything is like that. All right. So as you guys can see, I'm just going to place this on about three different points on the base right here. Now this is a very popular solution. You guys, this is removable, reusable. It doesn't damage your furniture and this clay cold putty can do up to about 40 pounds. So all we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna take that base, push down at the base. You guys always remember that to push down at the base and never the top. And that's gonna form a strong bond right there. Next, we're gonna sample the museum gel for you guys. So as you guys can see, this is a very clear gel. Just don't forget it's there and rip off your white stem. So all we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit here, roll it up into the same balls or strips, place there. And we're going to do the same thing for this glass. We're going to place on the base at three separate corners, three separate uh, spots. Go. Just like that. It's very simple, you guys. And these can be found, like I said, at Home Depot, Lowe's, any of the major retailers. And all we're gonna wanna do is push down firmly and form that strong bond. You're gonna wanna give it about 24 to 48 hours to form that strong bond. And as you can see, those aren't going anywhere. And now it seems appropriate since we're living in 2020, we did secure uh, this globe here. So since it seems like it's a little bit of an upside down world, Right now, in 2020, we wanted to do this for you. All right, back to you guys. Hey, Trevin, before we continue, uh, there are a couple of questions that are kind of relevant to the things you've been showing. Uh, one yep. is, you know, you're talking about I small items to securing. We've also talked about bookshelves. What about how to secure books on open shelves? Yeah, absolutely. So there are um, flexible straps that are similar to like the bungee cord style that you can attach to either side. Uh, of those and then if you do need there's also like netting that you can use to install for those bookshelves and when you were showing how to um uh secure picture hangers uh uh there was a question about what wouldn't the nails jump off the wall uh and that's really what the uh amazing picture hook with the screw into the wall is about right it's yeah so if you have those larger paintings yeah i really recommend even if you have a smaller painting that's valuable it means a lot to you guys you can still use those screws because they are there are enough screws to make sure that you can install every single one of those uh, into the stud in the wall. And also a question about securing large, valuable antique cabinets. How large, do you valuable those? antique. Yeah, so I still recommend using the furniture straps that we have that you guys were able to see before. It's a flexible nylon strap that you can either still secure to the side or to the top. That way it's not going to be seen and the colors will match your antique cabinet, hopefully. All right. Thanks, Trevin. You got it, guys. That's fantastic. Let's continue with our improved scenario. So now you head into the kitchen and you notice all the cabinet doors are closed and nothing has fallen to the floor. How did you do that? Well, there are very various types of latches that you can install. Let us show you one that we're really proud of. Check out this video. No tools are needed. You simply clean the surface. Peel off the adhesive. Uh, the cover of the adhesive and, and attach what's called the housing. Put a template onto the housing. Close the door. Open the door. 
the template is now on the door. Again, remove the red backing and place what's called the catch and remove the template. Now you set the hook and you just use the door like normal. But in ground shaking, the latch will fall into the catch. It's called Seisma latch. They were, they're a real great upgrade to baby latches and invented by an, an engineer at uh, JPL. Uh, I've, I've seen all sorts of different types of anchorage for latches and this is the most elegant I've seen. So let's go back to our kitchen. You look about and you see that re the refrigerator is in place. It hasn't moved because you've secured it. Remember Trish and Carlos at Safety Proof? Let's go back to them and Carlos is gonna, dem gonna demonstrate how to secure that refrigerator. He's already located the wall studs. The rest should be easy. Now remember, depending upon where you find your studs, you can always put straps on the top of the refrigerator if you prefer. First, we insert a screw through the bracket and then we're gonna drill it into the wall. Let's watch Carlos do that. Excellent, Carlos. Now the next thing is we prepare the surface for the refrigerator. Remember, the surface has to be prepared so that you have a good molecular bond to the side of the refrigerator. It's gonna remove the, the strip from the fastener. Then he'll apply it to the side of the refrigerator. And he's gonna hold and press for 30 seconds so he's got a really good bond. And you know, that's pretty much all it takes to establish that bond. Now, in case any of you are worried about remembering all these instructions, Carlos, give yourself a thumbs up. In case you're worried about remembering, all of the fasteners come with manufacturer's instructions. And so now you have that, that refrigerator fixed. Let me jump in with a quick question. Um, are some of these brackets removable so that you can clean like behind a refrigerator or a cabinet or a dresser? Yeah, so all of the fasteners themselves are quick release. Uh, and in this picture here, you can kind of see the little tab that pops up. Uh, so, so on these, uh, we, you just press down on the tab and it releases, it releases the fastener. And can um, I also ask you, sure. do the straps damage the finish on the furniture? Are they, are they removable? No, uh, and, and whether you're using this or the Velcro straps, uh, one thing that's in common is that, is that the very high bond is called a VHB3M adhesive. It's actually used on antiques, antiques. It's used in laboratories on real sensitive equipment like centrifuges and incubators, uh, and it doesn't damage it at all. So it's one of the benefits to using this specific adhesive is it sticks to most every surface and it, um, it absolutely will not damage the surface. Great, thank you. Sure, so, so one more thing I wanted to point out, that the only difference between the fasteners used on the refrigerator and the ones that you would use on a bookcase or a dresser is the size of the fastener. Here we use a slightly larger fastener because the refrigerator weighs more than the average dresser. We wanted more surface area on the adhesive. But the general idea for flexible fastening is the same. All right, what about the refrigerator doors? We saw in that video how the doors flew open and the wine bottles tragically went everywhere. There are a lot of options to keep doors closed. There are latches, there are metal drop down brackets. For a limited time, um, the door latch is included free with the uh, refrigerator fastener strap from Safety Proof. So that that little uh, red and white strap is how you would keep the doors closed. Well, guess what, Glenn, folks? Glenn, hold yeah, on. Go ahead. Continue. Sure. Uh, just a question about a home with a built-in refrigerator, where yeah. the cabinet's closing all the way around. So well, I want to I consider that because we that is a lot of kitchens have have appliances, stoves. Uh, sometimes washer, dryer, refrigerators, built into like what we would call a cubby. In those instances, those things aren't coming out of there in an earthquake. They can't move up. They can't move lateral. 
They can't even tip if there's a cabinet up top of them. So you don't worry about it. You d so sometimes when you're doing your hazard hunt, think about what could possibly move in an earthquake. Uh, and, and the motion it would take to get a built-in refrigerator out of the cabinet it's built into, just imagine how hard it is, you know how hard it is to move the darn thing out if you wanna clean behind it. Uh, so, so I want you to uh, rest easy. If, you, if, you, if something is built in, most likely it's not going anywhere. And also Glenn, uh, we, earlier you were at Safety Proof were showing a certain type of stud finder. Is that a brand name? Is that why you recommend that type? Yeah, well, uh, and it's not our brand, so they should yeah. be giving me a really big commission for this. Uh, we, it's a J.H. Hansen Stud Finder. They're, they're under $10. You can get them online. Uh, I'm not so sure. I know you used to find them at Osh, but I think they went out of business. Uh, so probably online is where you would get those. But and there are other types of rare earth magnet, and that's really what we use instead of the electronic ones. Uh, these will pick up metal, but they won't attach like to the copper pipes because they're non-magnetic. Well, guess what, folks? You did it. To finish our scenario, you know where your emergency supplies are. You know they're up to date and you're ready to go. So now at this point, two or three minutes after the ground has quit shaking and another minute closer to the first aftershock, you are safe. Your child is safe. You may have some broken and fallen items about the house that you gotta clean up. It happens after every earthquake. But guess what? Now you can begin your post-earthquake plan and you can be a valuable resource to your community. How much did this set you back? Well, doing this all at once may be more than you have in a budget. We put some estimated prices down. But you can also do it over time and you certainly don't have to wait to start. Some of these items are very inexpensive. Perhaps you can get your neighborhood and everybody can do it at once. You know, have a Saturday for refrigerators or something like that. Fasten your TV Friday. These quake hold items are available to almost all retailers. Safety proof you can get at safetyproof.com and at amazon.com. But our encouragement is to get started and think about other things that are included in step one that you have in your house that maybe we didn't cover. You know, the piano or the freestanding range. Pay special attention to your water heater. Standard water heaters should have two straps, upper and lower and flexible hoses. They should be supported up off the ground. Many items and how to secure them are listed at earthquakecountry.org slash step one. And if you need help, reach out. There's experts in the field have been doing this a long time. And guess what? It's not too tough for you to become an expert too. And that's my encouragement today. So let's turn this back to Inez. Glenn, uh, is it possible to, uh, could you explain how to uh, secure table lamps? If most table lamps are going to be very lightweight. So uh, the museum putty uh, can be used to hold that in place. Uh, the, the gel or wax, uh, hold, hold it in place. Uh, I've also secured table lamps to the end table using simple lassos that we make out of uh, a monofilament. So somebody should get creative with custom fixes. Bottom line is since sizes and shapes are really what we're bracing and table lamps can be all different sizes and shapes. We probably wanna take a look at exactly what, you, what needs to be secured and then offer the best recommendation. And then also, of course, you, if the end table lamp is on an end table, secure the end table. And also for securing a floor lamp, what would you recommend? Same type of, same type of thing. Sometimes, look, uh, aesthetics matter. And sometimes you don't want a strap or a lasso going around a, a lamp, but sometimes you, you figure, I'd just rather not move this lamp. So you're, or uh, I'd rather not lose this lamp. So you're gonna do what it takes to secure it. Again, some, so we've used a monofilament that is clear. Uh, we've used different uh, straps to anchor the, the, 
freestanding lamp to the floor as well, based on the floor. If it's carpet, you may have some other issues and you, you can all, quite often secure to a base plate a kick plate at the bottom of a wall uh, that's structurally pretty sound and you can secure the bottom of the lamp to that. So different ways, again, based on different shapes and sizes of lamps. Thanks, Glenn and Trevin and Trish and Carlos too. Before we take more questions, let's hear once again from Mark Benthian. Thanks, Inez. So if you, were with us, if you were with us at the beginning, there was a video we played that recreated the Northridge earthquake. Let's look again at how what we've learned today could have helped then. So here Bucky was hanging something that she thought might fall off uh, if the earthquake happened the next day, which it did. She's now going to be using the amazing picture hook in this uh, shelf full of videotapes, also being secured with a safety proof buckle. Here's the amazing picture hook. Now, one thing about this is it's done kind of wrong in the video. Hang that behind the item, not up above it. You don't want to see it uh, when it's actually in use. Okay, so one thing that, of course, I'm going to turn my camera on. One of the things that the uh, Earthquake Country Alliance is, is known for is creating the great shakeout earthquake drills back in 2008. So we definitely got to give a mention of that, that it is coming up uh, this year, October 15th. It's always the third Thursday of October. We are going to, by the way, getting to answer more of your questions. So just a couple of slides before then. Shakeout is going to happen. And you might be wondering, well, my organization or my school or uh, we're not all necessarily going to be together because of, of COVID. What can we do? Can we, should we still do an earthquake drill? Well, of course, you should actually be practicing for what you would do in a, in a different situation. Uh, earthquakes don't always happen at uh, 10, 15 in the morning on a Thursday. So you want to be looking at maybe we have our drill in the evening or on a weekend at, and in any year uh, that you might do shakeout. And this year you might think about doing a distributed drill, maybe even a drill where everyone's on Zoom and you kind of talk about it and you get below your desk and come up and talk some more. We're gonna have advice on all sorts of different ways that you can adapt ShakeOut uh, this year. So go ahead and register uh, at shakeout.org. Uh, start looking for that. We're gonna be adding more resources to the webpage and sending out emails about these alternative ways, the flexibility that we always have with ShakeOut. You can always do it on any day. But this year we understand it might need to be a bit more different and unique. Uh, one way uh, to connect through ECA, of course, is through our websites. We do have a web page in Spanish at terremotos.org. Our main website is at earthquakecountry.org. You can email us with follow-up questions from today's mm -hmm. webinar or at any time uh, at info at earthquakecountry.org. And then also you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook twitter.com slash ECA, facebook.com slash Earthquake Country Alliance. So Ines, back to you. Thanks, Mark. And you might be wondering if there are people who can come to your home and we'll be starting a training program. So that maybe could be you or someone you know could be trained in how to do this, all of this uh, that you've seen today. So, okay, let's see if we have any more questions. Uh, we have a question. After initial quake is completed, should you leave your home before an aftershock comes? I can answer that. So evacuating is always really kind of a, uh, a, a, a decision you, you might need to make. You want to plan for if you need to or not. So if you don't really see a lot of damage, it's maybe okay just to stay in your home. The aftershock uh, of course, you want to be ready for to drop cover, hold on if it happens, but we don't recommend always uh, evacuating uh, after earthquakes. It may put you at risk for, um, you know, the weather not being well or, or things falling off of buildings. Uh, only if you really are seeing damage or have a sense there's damage or, if, of course, if there's a fire uh, or if you're near the shore and you need to get to high ground because perhaps you felt strong shaking and that shaking was off the coast and there maybe there's a tsunami. So it's not an always thing, and especially if you're in a large building and you're in a high rise, you know, the 
evacuating when there was no damage uh, and being in stairwells with a lot of people during an aftershock may not be safe either. So you really have to kind of figure out your own situation. It's a tricky question. Thanks, Mark. We have a question for Glenn. You mentioned the water heater should be off the floor on a stand. My water heater is strapped to the wall, but not on a stand. Is my water heater still secure? Your water heater is still secured, but is not secured to code. One of the things that we, we have to do or that is required that we do as part of the earthquake brace bolt program is we inspect the anchorage of water heaters. It really should be elevated off the ground, but so far as how it will perform in an earthquake without that stand that it's on, uh, so far as just earthquakes only, it's fine. Uh, the next question is, is there anything you can do about hanging light fixtures? The um, hanging light fixtures that are sold in California, that, so this would be, this would also cover fans, chandeliers, stuff like that. If they're sold in the state of California, they're also, they are, this is the similar with wall mounted televisions. They should come with earthquake restraints as part of the kit for installation. If you're in a home that was built and there's a light fixture hanging there and this home was built before 1980, you're, it probably doesn't have an additional earthquake. And it's just a steel strap that you can run down in the middle of the, of the light that holds it to the ceiling up above. So again, based on the age of it, it, it may already be fine. Uh, but it may not if it's older. Hey, Thank Glenn, you. another question from uh, earlier in today's webinar. Uh, Julie asked, my home also has kitchen cabinets that have the quake resistant magnetic latches uh, from about 1996. Uh, the ones that have the little ball that catches when you push. Uh, are those still good? Is there anything that you might do different now? I know you, Glenn, I know you, have, you showed the Seismo latch, but uh, yeah. What do you think of those? I have I have those ball and catch latches. Actually, uh, my aunt has them in her home, uh, and and if you, if I want you to think about this kind of the same way that you would think about uh, the built-in refrigerator. Okay, what it would take to open that in an earthquake uh, is is motion directly perpendicular to the door that hits in a way where it's not all, I'm using my hands here, is not all moving as one unit. Somehow the door is moving at a different rate than the cabinet and theoretically they certainly could open. Those ball and catch devices are not engineered to be earthquake restraints. They're engineered to be locking devices for your cabinets that, that also upgrade your cabinets and, they, and they're great. Um, so the any kind of magnet thing any 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 sort of that uh you know in the you can get you can get in the weeds in this in in if you get too nerdy about it then you can miss the point so friction is not supposed to be something considered in earthquakes and magnetism isn't yeah but really if it, if it holds and you're happy with it use it if you don't have anything get the seismal latches and put them in Thanks, Glenn. Uh, we also had a question from earlier about uh, crib walls that are from two to five foot high. Uh, and uh, years ago, they, they faced these with plywood and long uh, wood screws. Okay, this was done open loop. Uh, is there any way of securing a crib? Um, and this is really pretty simple. Remember, we're, we're fastening shapes. Cribs have a lot of openings between the uh, vertical slats. Uh, so think crib, a bunk bed, same type of thing. We got posts sticking up, lasso around that post and attached to a wall stud. So, so you, you cannot tip, it cannot slide away, cannot fall, you've restrained it to the wall. So using lassos is another effective way of keeping things in place. Uh, we have them on our website. I'm sure, I'm sure Ready America has similar stuff uh, where you're lassoing to hold an item uh, in place and you don't, there's no room necessarily for the fastener adhesive. 
Trevin, are you there? Yeah, can you guys see I'll me? Ask, I'll post a question to you. Are there companies that can come out and do this type of work for a service? So I'm actually in talks with uh, a new partnership about finding people that young college kids that come out and do that, but it's still in the very early stages. Uh, right now, there's not many people that can come out and do this unless you have a contractor uh, or a handyman that you already have these fasteners or fasteners with you or you've already purchased them, that they can install those for you. So just, yeah, a simple handyman or contractor can do that for you. And as that's well. for the, like a home situation. But, and that's, uh, yeah, for the home situation. If, yeah, more like industrial, then, yeah, we obviously have people for that. Both Safety Proof and Ready America do install this type of uh, equipment in hospitals and businesses, kind of larger organizations. For, for the purposes of your house, um, we, we try to cover everything today that really, when you think about it, you're, you're going to need a cordless drill and, and the bit to go over the screw. Uh, so you have to get that, probably have to get a stud finder, but a lot of this is DIY. Uh, and then particularly since COVID um, and, and Zoom has such an amazing capability, you can call uh, or email and hold your phone up and, and uh, say, I'm concerned about this, what do I do? And, and basically be held by the hand and walk through how to get it secured. And then if it's something beyond what you'd reasonably be expected to do, then uh, we'll work on trying to get you the right person to get it fixed. We have another question. Uh, during the Northridge quake, some refrigerators attached to wall studs ripped the studs out of the wall. How can this be prevented? You know, the, the advent of flexible fastening has really helped eliminate that. Most, most of the uh, wall failure in Northridge resulted on pot metal or uh, rigid bracing that that literally the, the item they were anchoring was so heavy and the wall wouldn't support the load, it brought the wall down. When you're using flexible fastening, then the wall and the floor can move independently of one another. And you, there's not that much force. Uh, on shake table tests, I've seen, I've seen the strap act almost like a shock absorber. So it lowers, it, in, in any shake table testing that we've seen using flexible fasteners, there's never been an issue with wall studs. Even on the heavy um, type of fastening that we did and heavier on big pieces uh, with flexible fastening, the, uh, the adhesive holds and the unit doesn't go anywhere and the wall is fine. Great, thank you, Glenn. And if we couldn't get to your questions, please email it to info at earthquakecountry.org and we will respond. Also, if you aren't a current member of the ECA, join now to be notified of the next webinars in the series at earthquakecountry.org alliance. Finally, soon you'll receive an email about a survey about this webinar. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. And finally, thank you for joining us and have a fantastic day.